Emer, I don't know if you're sick of talking about this or not, but we have to mention the 25th anniversary. Oh. Um, it's incredibly poignant that we're in Maynooth as well. That's um, true. Will you tell us a bit about your connection with Maynooth as we're here in St. Mary's Church? Yeah, oh my God. Maynooth for me was like, I don't know, it was, it was a solace because I won the Eurovision on a Saturday night and then I flew back on the Sunday and I came into college on the Monday morning. And it was, I needed to do it because I actually, I was so overwhelmed, so overwhelmed by the media attention and the, the need to promote the song and all of that. Um, the security team were amazing because we clearly had um, the RT News crew in the campus and everything and I was taking exams. So I said, I'm sorry, can't do anything, I'm doing exams. We did um, a little press conference and a photo op in the Beverunga room um, in the Logic building. And, um, and then, yeah, I was, the security team took me to my exams. I sat my exams and the university were extraordinary. They were extraordinary. They were like parents who just like put their arms around me and minded me and it's exactly what I needed at the time actually till I got my head around the whole thing. Because yeah. I can't imagine. Do you mind me asking how you did in the exams, generally speaking? Yeah, yeah you I did think well. I got a two one. Oh my God, like, <laughs> because it must have been, I suppose it's a different discipline, isn't it? Like I come yeah. from a kind of a rock and roll background and by that I kind of mean I wasn't trained. <laughs> so I think it's probably different when you're dealing with people whose goal, I mean, for Maynooth to have you on that stage must have been a really wonderful thing for them. Well, they always made me feel that, which was really generous of them. Always they did. Um, and they always made me feel that they were very proud of me, but mostly I was very proud to be part of the community here. I think it, at the time it was, it was an incredibly special place to be. And then subsequently what happened was I took those exams and then my work took off and I had this great opportunity and I was had my head around it as I say and I got back into it on my own terms and um, so at one point I realized there was no point in giving up a career in music to go and study for a career in music so I realized the thing I had to do was defer and my professor at the time Jared Gillen was very supportive and the whole college administration was incredibly supportive about it, it was very last minute and equally six years later when I released an album with Decca Records and and it had just kind of petered off. I had this window that I thought I can tear for it now. And six years later, I went back and did the final year. And literally, I emailed them two weeks later, I was in back in college. So, and I had a really clear run of it to Christmas. And then the second semester was nuts, but we did it. I got it done and I graduated, yeah, in 2002. Amazing. And like, you've so many, this is very on the nose, but strings to your bow. and. You know, you weren't obviously an incredible singer, but you weren't you weren't just a singer, and you never intended on just being a singer. And you've, you're a composer and, and so many other things. You obviously at some point got control, in spite of all the, you yeah. know, mania over this one song. You you did get control back of what you wanted to do with your career. Well, it was really stupid, but the only thing I could do, I think, at the time, was that I actually the song was brilliantly successful because it was a great song by Brendan Graham, it's a fantastic song. It charted in the UK, which Eurovision Song hadn't done for years. And so Polydor, who had it, were like, come on, let's push it, let's push it. And I'm like, no, I'm doing my exams. And they're like, who is this crazy person? And um, it really gave me a chance to step back and realize that um, I don't know this industry. This isn't the type of music I perform. I was classically trained, I was a chorister, I was in the new chamber chorus in Christchurch Cathedral Choir. This was my life. And I thought if I'm going to be involved in this, I need to learn it. So that's exactly what I did. I, I set up a label, I went into studio, recorded some songs, I released a solo release, like an independent release just to learn the industry. And um, so this was before studios in your bedroom, clearly. So um, this was with Paul Ash Brown. Uh, he had a great studio on Grand Canal Street. I went in there, we worked on old classic two inch tape. And, um, and it was great. And that's when I recorded Winter Fire and Snow uh, definitively for Brendan because that was the song that I had introduced me to Brendan so that was the way I had to learn the industry and then after I went on and I got a manager and I signed to a label and all of that but I kind of knew not fully who I was going to be and who I was going to express myself as but I had a little bit more of my feet on the ground and an idea how the thing worked you know. That brings us nicely to this beautiful album you released, Eru, am I saying that oh, correctly? Eru, yeah. I yeah. have it on repeat, it's just oh a medicine, oh, particularly thank in the you. past couple of years I really had a point of 
not being able to listen to a lot of music. It just mm -hmm. all felt a bit mm -hmm. scary and a bit intense. Mm -hmm. This album, I, I feel you, you made for me. <laughs> but I really do, and there's so many, I mean, just when I saw John Sheehan's name on it, yeah. I thought, what a beautiful pairing. I assume you've worked together loads of times before, and that particular song is just incredible. Oh, John Sheehan, you know, like, I mean, the, I'm just in awe of him, and what an extraordinary honour to get to collaborate with him and to perform with him. And, and that came around in the most beautifully natural of ways, as is everything with John, that we were both um, performing in the Royal Albert Hall um, for when Michael D. Higgins went and they put on a concert, this Kalura concert. Yes, yeah, and we met there and we were performing on that. And then the next morning we were chatting at breakfast in the hotel and he was telling me about different tunes he's written. He's such a beautiful composer and he was telling me about this tune he had that he called Paddy Fields. And, um, and he was kind of humming it to me and then he played a little bit of it and I said, John, would you mind if I did something with that? And that's just how that happened, just like that. That's what we've missed, yeah. isn't it, the last couple of years, yeah. is those little Moments. backstage, side yeah. stage. You know, I don't yeah. think we can explain to people who aren't in it how much we've lost, really, in yeah. those terms. So no, you're right. Those, it's that so human great. contact and that, you know, what the Americans call networking, but it is, it's like, it is basically just life, you know, conversations per chance. You meet someone, you have this chat. You know, it's that's the way it just sparks. That's how the cycle continues. And you're right. You know, um, now by the same token, it's still possible to do it. You know, but it's a lot less um, spontaneous. You know, like I have a new song just out now called Winter Solstice, and it's a song I wrote with Brendan actually a couple of years ago. And I decided to record it, release it properly, make a video because I was afraid that the concerts would all be pulled and I would have nothing to communicate with my audience with this year. So I, I, just at the very last minute, I thought, oh my God, what if these gigs go now? I need something to share so I can keep feeling that relationship. And um, so I called my friend Sarah, who I do a lot of composition with Sarah Class, and I said, you know, listen to this with just voice and piano. How do you think it sounds? And she's like, oh, I'd love to write some strings for that. I think it really... So then we did, we had this banter back and forth and she started to write this arrangement, which was so beautiful. And then we mixed it. So I had the banter with the mixing engineer and I'm like, yay, this feels good, you know? But it was, you know, yeah, but it's and not natural. the same. It feels yeah. natural. You're like, oh, this is what I actually do. Yeah, you know, but it was spontaneous because the last recording I did was Eru, which I'd recorded before the pandemic hit and then released it during the pandemic. And it'd been a while since I had that kind of, yeah, back and forth feeling of not just sitting in front of a keyboard or a computer on your own, you know. Like a little yeah. bit, we're getting a little bit of it back now, I think, yep. bit by bit, especially with shows like this and people kind of working behind the scenes yeah. to allow us all to do Absolutely. a bit of hanging out outside of these wonderful streaming shows you get to do. So, Ian McQuinn, I am so excited that you're here, Kildare Comeback Pleasure. Festival. I know that you're in Geneva, and so it's kind of welcome home. Thank you. And we're so honoured to have you thank on this you. show, so thank you so much. I can't wait for oh, your show. Oh, the pleasure's mine. Thanks, Mickey. Thank you. Hello there, I'm May Kay. I'm very happy to be here in St. Mary's Church in Maynooth for another amazing night of music as part of the Kildare Comeback Festival. Thank you for watching through KildareCulture.com. I hope you're all very cozy and warm wherever you're watching from. We are all a very happy bunch of people, both artists and crew, to have these shows happening at the moment. And with that, I'd like to thank Davis Events, Kildare County Council, and the Department of Tourism, Culture, Art, the Gale Talk, Sport and Media's Live Performance Support Scheme. Thank you all for all of your hard work and for allowing these to go ahead. Without further ado, and a woman who needs no introduction to any self-respecting Irish person. Please enjoy this show. It's Emer Quinn.
uh, started to look at getting some Christmas songs together, I wanted to draw inspiration from all kinds of places. And part of where I looked was through ancient texts and Latin texts. And then I came across this piece of, um, of writing by the most extraordinary writer of all, William Shakespeare. And it is a scene from Hamlet, and it describes the time of year where it says, in this time of year, you know, we needn't be afraid of the, the witching spirits because this time is so hallowed and so gracious. It's no fairy takes, no spirit walks, no witch hath power to charm, so hallowed and so gracious is the time. And so I weaved this song around it and it's called The Season Has Come. Season has come, you see it in the sky, short as day and dark as night, in the east in the morning sky, orient is burning bright. Season has come, the early has gone. so much. My mini, my mini audience, most welcome is the crew is the audience tonight. And uh, to be fair, any size of an audience makes my heart feel very happy. And, um, and I know that this audience here is only representative of all of you who are at home and who are joining us. And I really genuinely I'm picturing you all now sitting in front of your TVs, computer screens, iPhones, tablets, and thank you so much for tuning in to us and for, um, for joining us and also 
completely, of, obviously, for the Department of Culture and Kildare County Council for having the initiative to support the artists in this way. At this time, um, we're all Bulabus, we're all extraordinarily grateful. Um, and, you know, it goes from the length and breadth in every corner of the country, and um, it means a lot. And uh, I want to do a little tour now down the East Coast and take you to County Wexford, um, to Kilmore Quay, and um, talk about the beautiful carols that were there and that are there and that were there for the longest time, only there, hidden and secret in that community and passed on generation to generation. Um, now they're out in the world, and the most popular and well-known of them is the eponymous Wexford Carol or Kilmore Carol or. Ennis Gorthy Carroll, everybody in Wexford is claiming it, and I can't say I blame them. Um, also, you know, Alison Krauss and Yo-Yo Ma did a claim of it too, and that's very beautiful. We have our own, um, our own little spin on it here, and what I like about it, because I sing Christmas carols from lots of different countries and lots of different backgrounds, and to me, this is the one that feels Irish in the sense, obviously, with its melodies, rather unusual, but it's that it feels like it's telling the story of nativity. It's like, pull up a chair, sit by the fire. Hold on till I tell you. Good people all this Christmas time can see the For there you 
with thankful hearts and joyful minds the shepherds went to the to find and as God's angel had foretold they did our Savior Christ behold with no Thank you so much. Um, I've been singing these songs my whole life, literally. I always wanted to sing. Um, I pretended I was an opera singer, like when I was, could make sound, you know, three or four, much to my family's <laughs> um, chagrin. But in the end, it all came good. And the steps along the way definitely included my experiences in choirs and church choirs, starting in another St. Mary's, um, a St. Mary's Dominican Priory Church in Tala, where I grew up. My older sister, Neve, was in the choir already, and I must have been about four, and I was chomping at the bit. I could not wait to get up and sing, like, with her and the, all the others. And then Christmas morning, they let all the little teeter-totters come up, and we did bring a gift to the altar, um, wrapped in the old, you know, um, five for 50 wrapping paper. And then we got to stand beside our older siblings um, to sing. And I remember so clearly singing O Little Town of Bethlehem. And it appealed to me so much that when I arranged it, I tried to create that sense of wonder. So this is it. to human 
has transported. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I think I would like to sing you another very old carol. Now maybe, oh, oh come on, come on, Manuel, my, yeah. There's um, it's this really interesting set of um, ancient uh, Latin texts. And there's these things, they're called an antiphon. So basically, for those who don't know about the old Latin uh, offices in the church, um, there's the, the offices that are the same every day. So you say the same prayers at the same time every single day. But the only thing that varies it is a little piece that goes in front of it called an antiphon, and that's special to that day in the year. And um, there are these collections of antiphons that are really, really beautiful, and they run for Advent. And they're called the O Antivons. Because the O is like the summoning and the proclamation of Christ is coming. And they use all of the different names, like Clavis David and um, O Emmanuel. O, and they have the various different um, ancient names for Christ during the days of Advent. And they're very, very beautiful. And then in the 16th uh, century, these were kind of amalgamated to um, this traditional French melody, and each one of these antiphon texts were kind of compiled and put into the carol that we know now as O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. So I'd like to sing you, first of all, the O Emmanuel chant, so you get a sense of the lineage of where it came from right to this very day, and follow it by O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Rejoice, rejoice, and 
I'd forgotten his thirsty work. A um, little out of the habit. Hmm. It's so amazing to be singing again. There's been times, I have to say, you know, there's been obviously for everyone moments of despair. Um, and for those in the creative arts, I think it, that kind of just spreads its tentacles every which way. Um, for me, I certainly feel that there's been times, the first year I kind of felt, you know, plugged in, the second year, I think I felt, because I had this big release and I was busy and I was going and, you know, you thought it might end. And, and then I kind of feel that over the last number of months, you know, when I wasn't sure whether or not there were gonna be any more concerts for a long time, I began to think of it nearly as my former career, you know. I began to feel like I don't do this anymore, you know. And um, it's funny how that sets in, and then you begin to to really, um, I don't know, see things differently. And then just to come here today and to sing makes everything make sense again. So it's just really lovely. Uh, it's a lovely Christmas present for me, and I hope it's a nice Christmas present for you. Um, there's something that is a piece of music that we like to sing this time of year um, and uh, the reason we do is because when, when I was trying to explain the nativity to my now 12 year old when she was about um, she was about four or five because she was doing a nativity you know in a nativity play and she said and then the angel, like, did it come in the window or what? Did it, it said to Mary, you're going to have a baby. And she was like, well, how does that thing work? <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. And she said, I think Mary's the most important person in Christmas. She said, I don't know about you. So I thought, you know what? We need to sing Mary's song at Christmas time. And um, yeah, we've been doing that for a long time. So this is the Kachini Vavilov uh, arrangement setting of... Ave Maria, and we love it.
Thank you. Um, there's this, um, this wonderful poem by um, Christina Rossetti, and um, it's about, I suppose, reflecting on her childhood and winter time and perhaps going to see a crib in, in a really harsh, cold conditions. And um, it's called In the Bleak Midwinter. It's a beautiful poem. It's been set by two composers very famously, um, Gustav Holst and Harold Dark. And I've sung it um, many, many, many times as a chorister, as a cathedral chorister in particular. Both of them, both of those settings are um, really, really popular in uh, this time of year in cathedrals and in nine lessons and carols and everything. And um, But I favour the Harold Dark one, uh, tips the other one to the post ever so slightly for me. And um, I just love the tenderness of the poem. And I think the melody doesn't get in its way, just serves it to us nicely. Uh, so this is Christina Rossetti's In the Bleak Midwinter. Um, there's a song I like to sing this time of year because it's very important to me in my life, in my career, and in my friendship with the amazing songwriter Brendan Graham. 
Um, he wrote this song, it's called Winter Fire and Snow, he wrote the music, is based on a poem by the late McDara Woods called Fire, Snow and Carnivale. And uh, he met McDara Woods in the wonderful Tyrone Guthrie Centre and um, he set this text to music. It's really beautiful. I sang it with Anuna um, in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin in 1995 and Brendan was sitting in the audience unbeknownst to me and uh, heard me sing and he was on the hunt at that time for a singer for a little song called The Voice for the National Song Contest. And so this is one of those serendipitous moments and it always makes me think that you just never know who will be listening, when they'll be listening, and what connections are out in the ether for you to just to reach out and grasp. And so um, this song makes me believe in the wonder of serendipity and makes me hope that anything is possible. It's a gorgeous song about a mother fearful for her son's return in the wild conditions and then she welcomes him home in winter, fire and snow. that I started to, um, to sing Christmas concerts, solo Christmas concert at, at all, and gather these wonderful friends with me here year in, year out, um, was because of an album that we all recorded together um, as a consequence of singing um, the, the song Oh Holy Night um, on Ryan Tobody's radio, radio show quite a long time ago. Um, Robbie wasn't in that morning when I sang with Ryan. It was, um, it was my very, very, very dear friend, Gavin Ralston, who came and played um, 
in his very cool, very chilled, very Gav way. And um, it was Gav's vibe and me singing along that did this kind of paired back, simple version of A Holy Night. And Aoife Miss Kelly was there playing cello that morning. We'd, um, we'd been singing at a, a concert the night before and it had been requested and this is what came out between the three of us. So, um, so then Robbie Overson and Michelle Mason and Maria Mason and Shu and Eurifa and Mary Louise Bow, then we all recorded this together and released it. And now we are so lucky because it keeps um, coming back around each Christmas and we have begun to build up an extraordinary relationship with you at Christmas time. We become part of your Christmas and you become part of ours. And it's all really thanks to this song. So I'd like to sing it for you now. Oh, <laughs> 
missed you, Gav. I felt him in the room. Um, thank you. And um, I felt you all in the room, I have to say. I felt you all in the room with us tonight. It's been uh, really, really special. Uh, really special for us to be here, for me to be in Maynooth, um, to sing within the stone walls here in St. Mary's Church, to remember the times that I came here and sang with the Maynooth Chamber Choir, our current minister, um, Catherine Martin was in the choir with me at the time. A beautiful singer, she is herself, in case you didn't know that. And um, they were happy, happy times. And um, I feel as though they have shaped me. And it's lovely to come back and make this full circle connection with Maynooth this Christmas and to make this connection with all of you way beyond Maynooth, across Ireland, across Europe, in the US. Australia, in Asia, wherever you're listening. Um, very, very, very happy Christmas to you. And um, I want to sing that little song that I mentioned because normally I'm not let out of the building without singing it. And uh, this is The Voice. Hana, happy Christmas. I can't handle this on my own. Um, I am good for absolutely nothing after that. I feel like we just got transported to up into a cloud for an hour. I, I can thank you on behalf of all the crew as well, by the way. We feel so lucky. Thank you. Um, 
I hope it was as magical for you at home watching it as it was for us here in St. Mary's in Maynooth. It's my only job really is to say goodnight and I'm finding it kind of difficult. Um, this is the Kildare Comeback Festival. What an amazing, amazing night of music um, from Emer Quinn and this incredible bunch of musicians. Thank you all so much. What a pleasure, yes. Thank you so much. Um, stay tuned to KildareCulture.com for more amazing music. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you're all safe and well wherever you're watching. Good night. Child is said to me, I am the voice of you.